section thirty six part two chapter three continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez this librivox recording is in the public domain in the square he saw the mayor and the principal inhabitants grouped together like the women they all stared in astonishment at the owner of the castle he was the most unexpected of apparitions while so many were fleeing toward paris this parisian had come to join them and share in their fate a smile of affection a look of sympathy began to appear on the rough bark-like countenances of the suspicious rustics for a long time desnoyers had been on bad terms with the entire village he had harshly insisted on his rights showing no tolerance in matters touching his property he had spoken many times of bringing suit against the mayor and sending half of the neighborhood to prison so his enemies had retaliated by treacherously invading his lands poaching in his hunting preserves and causing him great trouble with countersuits and involved claims his hatred of the community had even united him with the priest because he was on terms of permanent hostility with the mayor but his relations with the church turned out as fruitless as his struggles with the state the priest was a kindly old soul who bore a certain resemblance to renan and seemed interested only in getting alms for his poor out of don marcelo even carrying his good-natured boldness so far as to try to excuse the marauders on his property how remote these struggles of a few months ago now seemed to him the millionaire was greatly surprised to see the priest on leaving his house to enter the church greet the mayor as he passed with a friendly smile after long years of hostile silence they had met on the evening of august first at the foot of the church tower the bell was ringing the alarm announcing the mobilization to the men who were in the field and the two enemies had instinctively clasped hands all french this affectionate unanimity also came to meet the detested owner of the castle he had to exchange greetings first on one side then on the other grasping many a horny hand behind his back the people broke out into kindly excuses a good man with no fault except a little bad temper and in a few minutes m desnoyers was basking in the delightful atmosphere of popularity as the iron-willed old gentleman approached his castle he concluded that although the fatigue of the long walk was making his knees tremble the trip had been well worth while never had his park appeared to him so extensive and so majestic as in that summer twilight never so glistening white the swans that were gliding double over the quiet waters never so imposing the great groups of towers whose inverted images were repeated in the glassy green of the moats he felt eager to see at once the stables with their herds of animals then a brief glance showed him that the stalls were comparatively empty mobilization had carried off his best work horses the driving and riding horses also had disappeared those in charge of the grounds and the various stable boys were also in the army the warden a man upwards of fifty and consumptive was the only one of the personnel left at the castle with his wife and daughter he was keeping the mangers filled and from time to time was milking the neglected cows within the noble edifice he again congratulated himself on the adamantine will which had brought him thither how could he ever give up such riches he gloated over the paintings the crystals the draperies all bathed in gold by the splendor of the dying day and he felt more than proud to be their possessor this pride awakened in him an absurd impossible courage as though he were a gigantic gigantic being from another planet and all humanity merely an anthill that he could grind under foot just let the enemy come he could hold his own against the whole lot then when his common sense brought him out of this heroic delirium he tried to calm himself with an equally illogical optimism they would not come he did not know why it was but his heart told him that they would not get that far 
he passed the following morning reconnoitering the artificial meadows that he had made behind the park lamenting their neglected condition due to the departure of the men trying himself to open the sluice gates so as to give some water to the pasture lands which were beginning to dry up the grapevines were extending their branches the length of their supports and the full bunches nearly ripe were beginning to show their triangular lusciousness among the leaves ay who would gather this abundant fruit by afternoon he noted an extraordinary amount of movement in the village georgette the warden's daughter brought the news that many enormous automobiles and soldiers french soldiers were beginning to pass through the main street in a little while a procession began filing past on the high road near the castle leading to the bridge over the marne this was composed of motor trucks open and closed that still had their old commercial signs under their covering of dust and spots of mud many of them displayed the names of business firms in paris others the names of provincial establishments with these industrial vehicles requisitioned by mobilization were others from the public service which produced in desnoyers the same effect as a familiar face in a throng of strangers on their upper parts were the names of their old routes madeleine bastille passibourne etc probably he had travelled many times in these very vehicles now shabby and aged by twenty days of intense activity with dented planks and twisted metal perforated like sieves but rattling crazily on some of the conveyances displayed white discs with a red cross in the centre others had certain letters and figures comprehensible only to those initiates in the secrets of military administration within these vehicles the only new and strong motors he saw soldiers many soldiers but all wounded with head and legs bandaged ashy faces made still more tragic by their growing beards feverish eyes looking fixedly ahead mouths so sadly immobile that they seemed carven by agonizing groans doctors and nurses were occupying various carriages in this convoy escorted by several platoons of horsemen and mingled with the slowly moving horses and automobiles were marching groups of foot soldiers with cloaks unbuttoned or hanging from their shoulders like capes wounded men who were able to walk and joke and sing some with arms in splints across their breasts others with bandaged heads with clotted blood showing through the thin white strips the millionaire longed to do something for these brave fellows but he had hardly begun to distribute some bottles of wine and loaves of bread before a doctor interposed upbraiding him as though he had committed a crime his gifts might result fatally so he had to stand beside the road sad and helpless looking after the sorrowful convoy by nightfall the vehicles filled with the sick were no longer filing by he now saw hundreds of drays some hermetically sealed with the prudence that explosive material requires others with bundles and boxes that were sending out a stale odor of provisions then came great herds of cattle raising thick whirling clouds of dust in the narrow parts of the road prodded on by the sticks and yells of the shepherds and kepis his thoughts kept him wakeful all night this then was the retreat of which the people of paris were talking but in which many wished not to believe the retreat reaching even there and continuing its indefinite retirement since nobody knew what its end might be his optimism aroused a ridiculous hope perhaps this was only the retreat of the hospitals and stores which always follows an army the troops wishing to be rid of impedimenta were sending them forward by railway and highway that must be it so all through the night he interpreted the incessant bustle as the passing of vehicles filled with the wounded with munitions and eatables like those which had filed by in the afternoon toward morning he fell asleep through sheer weariness and when he awoke late in the day his first glance was toward the road he saw it filled with men and horses dragging some rolling objects 
but these men were carrying guns and were formed in battalions and regiments the animals were pulling the pieces of artillery it was an army it was the retreat desnoyers ran to the edge of the road to be more convinced of the truth alas they were regiments such as he had seen leaving the stations of paris but with what a very different aspect the blue cloaks were now ragged and yellowing garments the trousers faded to the color of a half-baked brick the shoes great cakes of mud the faces had a desperate expression with layers of dust and sweat in all their grooves and openings with beards of recent growth sharp as spikes with an air of great weariness showing the longing to drop down somewhere for ever killing or dying but without going a step further they were tramping 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 some marches had lasted thirty hours at a stretch the enemy was on their tracks and the order was to go on and not to fight freeing themselves by their fleet-footedness from the involved movements of the invader the chiefs suspected the discouraged exhaustion of their men they might exact of them complete sacrifice of life but to order them to march day and night for ever fleeing before the enemy when they did not consider themselves vanquished when they were animated by that ferocious wrath which is the mother of heroism their despairing expressions mutely sought the nearest officers the leaders even the colonel they simply could go no further such a long devastating march in such a few days and what for the superior officers who knew no more than their men seemed to be replying with their eyes as though they possessed a secret courage one more effort this is going to come to an end very soon the vigorous beasts having no imagination were resisting less than the men but their aspect was deplorable how could these be the same strong horses with glossy coats that he had seen in paris processions at the beginning of the previous month a campaign of twenty days had aged and exhausted them their dull gaze seemed to be imploring pity they were weak and emaciated the outline of their skeleton so plainly apparent that it made their eyes look larger their harness as they moved showed the skin raw and bleeding yet they were pushing on with a mighty effort concentrating their last powers as though human demands were beyond their obscure instincts some could go no further and suddenly collapsed from the sheer fatigue desnoyers noticed that the artillerymen rapidly unharnessed them pushing them out of the road so as to leave the way open for the rest there lay the skeleton-like frames with stiffened legs and glassy eyes staring fixedly at the first flies already attracted by their miserable carrion the cannons painted gray the gun carriages the artillery equipment all that don marcelo had seen clean and shining with the enthusiastic friction that man has given to arms from remote epochs even more persistent than that which woman gives to household utensils were now dirty overlaid with the marks of endless use with the wreckage of unavoidable neglect the wheels were deformed with mud the metal darkened by the smoke of explosion the gray paint spotted with mossy dampness in the free spaces in this file in the parentheses opened between battery and regiment were sandwiched crowds of civilians miserable groups driven on by the invasion populations of entire towns that had disintegrated following the army in its retreat the approach of a new division would make them leave the road temporarily continuing their march in the adjoining fields then at the slightest opening in the troops they would again slip along the white and even surface of the highway they were mothers who were pushing hand-carts heaped high with pyramids of furniture and tiny babies the sick who could hardly drag themselves along old men carried on the shoulders of their grandsons 
old women with little children clinging to their skirts a pitiful silent brood nobody now opposed the liberality of the owner of the castle his entire vintage seemed to be overflowing on the highway casks from the last grape gathering were rolled out to the roadside and the soldiers filled the metal ladles hanging from their belts with a red stream then the bottled wine began making its appearance by order of date and was instantly lost in the river of men continually flowing by desnoyers observed with much satisfaction the effects of his munificence the smiles were reappearing on the despairing faces the french jest was leaping from row to row and on resuming their march the groups began to sing then he went to see the officers who in the village square were giving their horses a brief rest before rejoining their columns with perplexed countenances and heavy eyes they were talking among themselves about this retreat so incomprehensible to them all days before in guise they had routed their pursuers and yet now they were continually withdrawing in obedience to a severe and endless order we do not understand it they were saying we do not understand an ordered and methodical tide was dragging back these men who wanted to fight yet had to retreat all were suffering the same cruel doubt we do not understand end of section thirty six in part two chapter three continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain and doubt was making still more distressing this day and night march with only the briefest rests because the heads of the divisions were in hourly fear of being cut off from the rest of the army one effort more boys courage soon we shall rest the columns in their retirement were extending hundreds of miles desnoyers was seeing only one division others and still others were doing exactly this same thing at that very hour their recessional extending across half of france all with the same disheartened obedience were falling back the men exclaiming the same as the officials we don't understand we don't understand don marcelo soon felt the same sadness and bewilderment as the soldiers he didn't understand either he saw the obvious thing what all were able to see the territory invaded without the germans encountering any stubborn resistance entire counties cities villages hamlets remaining in the power of the enemy at the back of an army that was constantly withdrawing his enthusiasm suddenly collapsed like a pricked balloon and all his former pessimism returned the troops were displaying energy and discipline but what did that amount to if they had to keep retreating all the time unable on account of strict orders to fight or defend the land just as it was in the seventies he sighed outwardly there is more order but the result is going to be the same as though a negative reply to his faint-heartedness he overheard the voice of a soldier reassuring a farmer we are retreating yes only that we may pounce upon the bush with more strength grandpa joffre is going to put them in his pocket when and where he will the mere sound of the marshal's name revived don marcelo's hope perhaps this soldier who was keeping his faith intact in spite of the interminable and demoralizing marches was nearer the truth than the reasoning and studious officers he passed the rest of the day making presents to the last detachments of the column his wine cellars were gradually emptying by order of dates he continued distributing thousands of bottles stored in the subterranean parts of the castle by evening he was giving to those who appeared weakest bottles covered with the dust of many years as the lines filed by the men seemed weaker and more exhausted stragglers were now passing painfully drawing their raw and bleeding feet from their shoes some 
had already freed themselves from these torture cases and were marching barefoot with their heavy boots hanging from their shoulders and staining the highway with drops of blood although staggering with deadly fatigue they kept their arms and outfits believing that the enemy was near desnoyers liberality stupefied many of them they were accustomed to crossing their native soil having to struggle with the selfishness of the producer nobody had been offering anything fear of danger had made the country folk hide their eatables and refuse to lend the slightest aid to their compatriots who were fighting for them the millionaire slept badly this second night in his pompous bed with columns and plushes that had belonged to henry the fourth according to the declarations of the salesmen the troops no longer were marching past from time to time there straggled by a single battalion a battery a group of horsemen the last forces of the rear guard that had taken their position on the outskirts of the village in order to cover the retreat the profound silence that followed the turmoil of transportation awoke in his mind a sense of doubt and disquietude what was he doing there when the soldiers had gone was he not crazy to remain there but immediately there came galloping into his mind the great riches which the castle contained if he could only take it all away that was impossible now through want of means and time besides his stubborn will looked upon such flight as a shameful concession we must finish what we have begun he said to himself he had made the trip on purpose to guard his own and he must not flee at the approach of danger the following morning when he went down into the village he saw hardly any soldiers only a single detachment of dragoons was still in the neighborhood the horsemen were scouring the woods and pushing forward the stragglers at the same time that they were opposing the advance of the enemy the troopers had obstructed the street with a barricade of carts and furniture standing behind this crude barrier they were watching the white strip of roadway which ran between the two hills covered with trees occasionally there sounded stray shots like the snapping of cords ours said the troopers these were the last detachments of sharpshooters firing at the advancing uhlans the cavalry of the rear guard had the task of opposing a continual resistance to the enemy repelling the squads of germans who were trying to work their way along to the retreating columns desnoyers saw approaching along the high road the last stragglers from the infantry they were not walking they rather appeared to be dragging themselves forward with the firm intention of advancing but were betrayed by emaciated legs and bleeding feet some had sunk down for a moment by the roadside agonized with weariness in order to breathe without the weight of their knapsacks and draw their swollen feet from their leather prisons and wipe off the sweat but upon trying to renew their march they found it impossible to rise their bodies seemed made of stone fatigue had brought them to a condition bordering on catalepsy so unable to move they were seeing dimly the rest of the army passing on as a fantastic file battalions more battalions batteries troops of horses then the silence the night the sleep on the stones and dust shaken by most terrible nightmare at daybreak they were awakened by bodies of horsemen exploring the ground rounding up the remnants of the retreat ay it was impossible to move the dragoons revolver in hand had to resort to threats in order to rouse them only the certainty that the pursuer was nearer and might make them prisoners gave them a momentary vigor so they were forcing themselves up by superhuman effort staggering dragging their legs and supporting themselves on their guns as though they were canes many of these were young men who had aged in an hour and changed into confirmed invalids poor fellows they would not go very far their intention was to follow on to join the column 
but on entering the village they looked at the houses with supplicating eyes desiring to enter them feeling such a craving for immediate relief that they forgot even the nearness of the enemy villeblanche was now more military than before the arrival of the troops the night before a great part of the inhabitants had fled having become infected with the same fear that was driving on the crowds following the army the mayor and the priest remained reconciled with the owner of the castle through his unexpected presence in their midst and admiring his liberality the municipal official approached to give him some news the engineers were mining the bridge over the marne they were only waiting for the dragoons to cross before blowing it up if he wished to go there was still time again desnoyers hesitated certainly it was foolhardy to remain there but a glance at the woods over whose branches rose the towers of his castle settled his doubts no no we must finish what we have begun the very last band of troopers now made their appearance coming out of the woods by different paths they were riding their horses slowly as though they deplored this retreat they kept looking behind carbine in hand ready to halt and shoot the others who had been occupying the barricade were already on their mounts the division reformed the commands of the officers were heard and a quick trot accompanied by the clanking of metal told don marcelo that the last of the army had left he remained near the barricade in a solitude of intense silence as though the world were suddenly depopulated two dogs abandoned by the flight of their masters leaped and sniffed around him coaxing him for protection they were unable to get the desired scent in that land trodden down and disfigured by the transit of thousands of men a family cat was watching the birds that were beginning to return to their haunts with timid flutterings they were picking at what the horses had left and an ownerless hen was disputing the banquet with the winged band until then hidden in the trees and roofs the silence intensified the rustling of the leaves the hum of the insects the summer respiration of the sunburnt soil which appeared to have contracted timorously under the weight of the men in arms desnoyers was losing exact track of the passing of time he was beginning to believe that all which had gone before must have been a bad dream the calm surrounding him made what had been happening here seem most improbable suddenly he saw something moving at the far end of the road at the very highest point where the white ribbon of the highway touched the blue of the horizon there were two men on horseback two little tin soldiers who appeared to have escaped from a box of toys he had brought with him a pair of field glasses that had often surprised marauders on his property and by their aid he saw more clearly the two riders clad in greenish gray they were carrying lances and wearing helmets ending in a horizontal plate they he could not doubt it before his eyes were the first uhlans for some time they remained motionless as though exploring the horizon then from the obscure masses of vegetation that bordered the roadside others and still others came sallying forth in groups the little tin soldiers no longer were showing their silhouettes against the horizon's blue the whiteness of the highway was now making their background ascending behind their heads they came slowly down like a band that fears ambush examining carefully everything around the advisability of prompt retirement made don marcelo bring his investigations to a close it would be most disastrous for him if they surprised him here but on lowering his glasses something extraordinary passed across his field of vision a short distance away so that he could almost touch them with his hand he saw many men skulking along in the shadow of the trees on both sides of the road his surprise increased as he became convinced that they were frenchmen wearing kepis where were they coming from he examined more closely with his spy-glass they were stragglers in a lamentable state of body with a picturesque variety of uniforms infantry zouaves dragoons without their horses 
and with them were forest guards and officers from the villages that had received too late the news of the retreat altogether about fifty a few were fresh and vigorous others were keeping themselves up by supernatural effort all were carrying arms they finally made the barricade looking continually behind them in order to watch in the shelter of the trees the slow advance of the uhlans at the head of this heterogeneous group was an official of the police old and fat with a revolver in his right hand his moustache bristling with excitement and a murderous glitter in his heavy-lidded blue eyes the band was continuing its advance through the village slipping over to the other side of the barricade of carts without paying much attention to their curious countryman when suddenly sounded a loud detonation making the horizon vibrate and the houses tremble what is that asked the officer looking at desnoyers for the first time he explained that it was the bridge which had just been blown up the leader received the news with an oath but his confused followers brought together by chance remained as indifferent as though they had lost all contact with reality might as well die here as anywhere continued the official many of the fugitives acknowledged this decision with prompt obedience since it saved them the torture of continuing their march they were almost rejoicing at the explosion which had cut off their progress instinctively they were gathering in the places most sheltered by the barricade some entered the abandoned houses whose doors the dragoons had forced in order to utilize the upper floors all seemed satisfied to be able to rest even though they might soon have to fight the officer went from group to group giving his orders they must not fire till he gave the word don marcelo watched these preparations with the immovability of surprise so rapid and noiseless had been the apparition of the stragglers that he imagined he must still be dreaming there could be no danger in this unreal situation it was all a lie and he remained in his place without understanding the deputy who was ordering his departure with the roughest words obstinate civilian the reverberation of the explosion had filled the highway with horsemen they were coming from all directions forming themselves into the advance group the uhlans were galloping around under the impression that the village was abandoned fire desnoyers was enveloped in a rain of crackling noises as though the trunks of all the trees had split before his eyes the impetuous band halted suddenly some of their men were rolling on the ground some were bending themselves double trying to get across the road without being seen others remained stretched out on their backs or face downward with their arms in front the riderless horses were racing wildly across the fields with reins dragging urged on by the loose stirrups after this rude shock which had brought them surprise and death the band disappeared instantly swallowed up by the trees End of section 37to chapter four of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four near the sacred grotto argensola had found a new occupation even more exciting than marking out the map of the manoeuvres of the armies i am now devoting myself to the taube he announced it appears from four to five with the precision of a punctilious guest coming to take tea every afternoon at the appointed hour a german aeroplane was flying over paris dropping bombs this would-be intimidation was producing no terror the people accepting the visit as an interesting and extraordinary spectacle in vain the aviators were flinging in the city streets german flags bearing ironic messages giving accounts of the defeat of the retreating army and the failures of the russian offensive lies all lies in vain they were dropping bombs destroying garrets killing or wounding old men women and babes oh the bandits the crowds would threaten with their fists the malign mosquito 
scarcely visible six thousand feet above them and after this outburst they would follow it with straining eyes from street to street or stand motionless in the square in order to study its evolutions the most punctual of all the spectators was argensola at four o'clock he was in the place de la concorde with upturned face and wide open eyes in most cordial good fellowship with all the bystanders it was as though they were holding season's tickets at the same theatre becoming acquainted through seeing each other so often will it come will it not come to-day the women appeared to be the most vehement some of them rushing up flushed and breathless fearing that they might have arrived too late for the show a great cry there it comes there it is and thousands of hands were pointing to a vague spot on the horizon with field glasses and telescopes they were aiding their vision the popular vendors offering every kind of optical instruments and for an hour the thrilling spectacle of an aerial hunt was played out noisy and useless the great insect was trying to reach the eiffel tower and from its base would come sharp reports at the same time that the different platforms spit out a fierce stream of shrapnel as it zigzagged over the city the discharge of rifles would crackle from roof and street every one that had arms in his house was firing the soldiers of the guard and the english and belgians on their way through paris they knew that their shots were perfectly useless but they were firing for the fun of retorting hoping at the same time that one of their chance shots might achieve a miracle but the only miracle was that the shooters did not kill each other with their precipitate and ineffectual fire as it was a few passers-by did fall wounded by balls from unknown sources argensola would tear from street to street following the evolutions of the inimical bird trying to guess where its projectiles would fall anxious to be the first to reach the bombarded house excited by the shots that were answering from below and to think that he had no gun like those khaki-clad englishmen or those belgians in barrack cap with tassel over the front finally the tauba tired of manoeuvring would disappear until to-morrow ejaculated the spaniard perhaps to-morrow's show may be even more interesting he employed his free hours between his geographical observations and his aerial contemplations in making the rounds of the stations watching the crowds of travellers making their escape from paris the sudden vision of the truth after the illusion which the government had been creating with its optimistic dispatches the certainty that the germans were actually near when a week before they had imagined them completely routed the taubes flying over paris the mysterious threat of the zeppelins all these dangerous signs were filling a part of the community with frenzied desperation the railroad stations guarded by the soldiery were only admitting those who had secured tickets in advance some had been waiting entire days for their turn to depart the most impatient were starting to walk eager to get outside the city as soon as possible the roads were black with the crowds all going in the same directions toward the south they were fleeing by automobile in carriages in gardeners carts on foot argensola surveyed this hegira with serenity he would remain because he had always admired those men who witnessed the siege of paris in eighteen seventy now it was going to be his good fortune to observe a historical drama perhaps even more interesting the wonders that he would be able to relate in the future but the distraction and indifference of his present audience were annoying him greatly he would hasten back to the studio in feverish excitement to communicate the latest gratifying news to desnoyers who would listen as though he did not hear him the night that he informed him that the government the chambers the diplomatic corps and even the actors of the comedie francaise were going that very hour on special trains for bordeaux his companion merely replied with a shrug of indifference 
desnoyers was worrying about other things that morning he had received a note from marguerite only two lines scrawled in great haste she was leaving starting immediately accompanied by her mother adieu and nothing more the panic had caused many love affairs to be forgotten had broken off long intimacies but marguerite's temperament was above such incoherencies from mere flight julio felt that her terseness was very ominous why not mention the place to which she was going in the afternoon he took a bold step which she had always forbidden he went to her home and talked a long time with the concierge in order to get some news the good woman was delighted to work off on him the loquacity so brusquely cut short by the flight of tenants and servants the lady on the first floor marguerite's mother had been the last to abandon the house in spite of the fact that she was really sick over her son's departure they had left the day before without saying where they were going the only thing that she knew was that they took the train to the gare d'orsay they were going toward the south like all the rest of the rich and she supplemented her revelations with the vague news that the daughter had seemed very much upset by the information that she had received from the front some one in the family was wounded perhaps it was the brother but she really didn't know with so many surprises and strange things happening it was difficult to keep track of everything her husband too was in the army and she had her own affairs to worry about where can she have gone julio asked himself all day long why does she wish to keep me in ignorance of her whereabouts when his comrade told him that night about the transfer of the seat of government with all the mystery of news not yet made public desnoyers merely replied they are doing the best thing i too will go to-morrow if i can why remain longer in paris his family was away his father according to argensola's investigations also had gone off without saying whither now marguerite's mysterious flight was leaving him entirely alone in a solitude that was filling him with remorse that afternoon when strolling through the boulevards he had stumbled across a friend considerably older than himself an acquaintance in the fencing club which he used to frequent this was the first time they had met since the beginning of the war and they ran over the list of their companions in the army desnoyers inquiries were answered by the older man so-and-so he had been wounded in lorraine and was now in a hospital in the south another friend dead in the vosges another disappeared at charlois and thus had continued the heroic and mournful roll-call the others were still living doing brave things the members of foreign birth young poles english residents in paris and south americans had finally enlisted as volunteers the club might well be proud of its young men who had practised arms in times of peace for now they were all jeopardizing their existence at the front desnoyers turned his face away as though he feared to meet in the eyes of his friend an ironical and questioning expression why had he not gone with the others to defend the land in which he was living to-morrow i will go repeated julio depressed by this recollection but he went toward the south like all those who were fleeing from the war the following morning argensola was charged to get him a railroad ticket for bordeaux the value of money had greatly increased but fifty francs opportunely bestowed wrought the miracle and procured a bit of numbered cardboard whose conquest represented many days of waiting it is good only for to-day said the spaniard you will have to take the night train packing was not a very serious matter as the trains were refusing to admit anything more than hand luggage argensola did not wish to accept the liberality of julio who tried to leave all his money with him heroes needed very little and the painter of souls was inspired with heroic resolution the brief harangue of gallieni in taking charge of the defence of paris he had adopted as his own he intended to keep up his courage to the last just like the hardy general 
let them come he exclaimed with a tragic expression they will find me at my post his post was the studio from which he could witness the happenings which he proposed relating to coming generations he would entrench himself there with the eatables and wines besides he had the plan just as soon as his partner should disappear of bringing to live there with him certain lady friends who were wandering around in search of a problematical dinner and feeling timid in the solitude of their own quarters danger often gathers congenial folk together and adds a new attractiveness to the pleasures of a community the tender affections of the prisoners of the terror when they were expecting momentarily to be conducted to the guillotine flashed through his mind let us drain life's goblet at one draught since we have to die the studio of the rue de la pompe was about to witness the mad and desperate revels of a castaway bark well stocked with provisions End of section 38part two chapter four continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain desnoyers left the gare d'orsay in a first-class compartment mentally praising the good order with which the authorities had arranged everything so that every traveller could have his own seat at the austerlitz station however a human avalanche assaulted the train the doors were broken open packages and children came in through the windows like projectiles the people pushed with the unreason of a crowd fleeing before a fire in the space reserved for eight persons fourteen installed themselves the passageways were heaped with mountains of bags and valises that served later travellers for seats all class distinctions had disappeared the villagers invaded by preference the best coaches believing that they would there find more room those holding first-class tickets hunted up the plainer coaches in the vain hope of travelling without being crowded on the crossroads were waiting from the day before long trains made up of cattle cars all the stables on wheels were filled with people seated on the wooden floor or in chairs brought from their homes every trainload was an encampment eager to take up its march whenever it halted layers of greasy papers hulls and fruit skins collected along its entire length the invaders pushing their way in put up with many annoyances and pardoned one another in a brotherly way in war times war measures they would always say as a last excuse and each one was pressing closer to his neighbor in order to make a few more inches of room and helping to wedge his scanty baggage among the other bundles swaying most precariously above little by little desnoyers was losing all his advantage as a first comer these poor people who had been waiting for the train from four in the morning till eight at night awakened his pity the women groaning with weariness were standing in the corridors looking with ferocious envy at those who had seats the children were bleeding like hungry kids julio finally gave up his place sharing with the needy and improvident the bountiful supplies of eatables with which argensola had provided him the station restaurants had all been emptied of food during the train's long wait soldiers only were seen on the platform soldiers who were hastening at the call of the trumpet to take their places again in the strings of cars which were constantly steaming toward paris at the signal stations long war trains were waiting for the road to be clear that they might continue their journey the cuirassiers wearing a yellow vest over their steel breastplate were seated with hanging legs in the doorways of the stable cars 
from whose interior came repeated neighing upon the flat cars were rows of gun carriages the slender throats of the cannon of seventy five were pointed upwards like telescopes young desnoyers passed the night in the aisle seated on a valise noting the sodden sleep of those around him worn out by weariness and exhaustion it was a cruel and endless night of jerks shrieks and stops punctuated by snores at every station the trumpets were sounding precipitously as though the enemy were right upon them the soldiers from the south were hurrying to their posts and at brief intervals another detachment of men was dragged along the rails toward paris they all appeared gay and anxious to reach the scene of slaughter as soon as possible many were regretting the delays fearing that they might arrive too late leaning out of the window julio heard the dialogues and shouts on the platforms impregnated with the acrid odor of men and mules all were evincing an unquenchable confidence the boches very numerous with huge cannons with many mitrailleuses but we only have to charge with our bayonets to make them run like rabbits the attitude of those going to meet death was in sharp contrast to the panic and doubt of those who were deserting paris an old and much decorated gentleman type of a jubilee functionary kept questioning desnoyers whenever the train started on again do you believe that they will get as far as tours before receiving his reply he would fall asleep brutish sleep was marching down the aisles with leaden feet at every junction the old man would start up and suddenly ask do you believe that we will get as far as bordeaux and his great desire not to halt until with his family he had reached an absolutely secure refuge made him accept as oracles all the vague responses at daybreak they saw the territorialists guarding the roads they were armed with old muskets and were wearing the red kepis as their only military distinction they were following the opposite course of the military trains in the station at bordeaux the civilian crowds struggling to get out or to enter other cars were mingling with the troops the trumpets were incessantly sounding their brazen notes calling the soldiers together many were men of darkest coloring natives with wide gray breeches and red caps above their black or bronzed faces julio saw a train bearing wounded from the battles of flanders and lorraine their worn and dirty uniforms were enlivened by the whiteness of the bandages sustaining the wounded limbs or protecting the broken heads all were trying to smile although with livid mouths and feverish eyes at their first glimpse of the land of the south as it emerged from the mist bathed in the sunlight and covered with the regal vestures of its vineyards the men from the north stretched out their hands for the fruit that the women were offering them tasting with delight the sweet grapes of the country for four days the distracted lover lived in bordeaux stunned and bewildered by the agitation of a provincial city suddenly converted into a capital the hotels were overcrowded with many notables contenting themselves with servants quarters there was not a vacant seat in the cafes the sidewalks could not accommodate the extraordinary assemblage the president was installed in the prefecture the state departments were established in the schools and museums two theatres were fitted up for the future reunions of the senate and the chamber of deputies julio was lodged in a filthy disreputable hotel at the end of a foul-smelling alley a little cupid adorned the crystals of the door and the looking-glass in his room was scratched with names and unspeakable phrases souvenirs of the occupants of an hour and yet many grand ladies hunting in vain for temporary residence would have envied him his good fortune 
all his investigations proved fruitless the friends whom he encountered in the fugitive crowd were thinking only of their own affairs they could talk of nothing but incidents of the installation repeating the news gathered from the ministers with whom they were living on familiar terms or mentioning with a mysterious air the great battle which was going on stretching from the vicinity of paris to verdun a pupil of his days of glory whose former elegance was now attired in the uniform of a nurse gave him some vague information the little madame laurier i remember hearing that she was living somewhere near here perhaps in biarritz julio needed no more than this to continue his journey to biarritz the first person that he encountered on his arrival was chichi she declared that the town was impossible because of the families of rich spaniards who were summering there the boches are in the majority and i pass a miserable existence quarrelling with them i shall finally have to live alone then he met his mother embraces and tears afterwards he saw his aunt elena in the hotel parlours most enthusiastic over the country and the summer colony she could talk at great length with many of them about the decadence of france they were all expecting to receive the news from one moment to another that the kaiser had entered the capital ponderous men who had never done anything in all their lives were criticizing the defects and indolence of the republic young men whose aristocracy aroused dona elena's enthusiasm broke forth into apostrophes against the corruption of paris corruption that they had studied thoroughly from sunset to sunrise in the virtuous schools of montmartre they all adored germany where they had never been or which they knew only through the reels of the moving picture films they criticized events as though they were witnessing a bullfight the germans have the snap you can't fool with them they are fine brutes and they appeared to admire this inhumanity as the most admirable characteristic why will they not say that in their own home on the other side of the frontier chichi would protest why do they come into their neighbor's country to ridicule his troubles possibly they consider it a sign of their wonderful good breeding but julio had not gone to biarritz to live with his family the very day of his arrival he saw marguerite's mother in the distance she was alone his inquiries developed the information that her daughter was living in po she was a trained nurse taking care of a wounded member of the family her brother undoubtedly it is her brother thought julio and he again continued his trip this time going to po his visits to the hospitals there were also unavailing nobody seemed to know marguerite every day a train was arriving with a new load of bleeding flesh but her brother was not among the wounded a sister of charity believing that he was in search of someone of his family took pity on him and gave him some helpful directions he ought to go to lourdes there were many of the wounded there and many of the military nurses so desnoyers immediately took the short cut between po and lourdes he had never visited the sacred city whose name was so frequently on his mother's lips for dona luisa the french nation was lourdes in her discussions with her sister and other foreign ladies who were praying that france might be exterminated for its impiety the good senora always summed up her opinions in the same words when the virgin wished to make her appearance in our day she chose france this country therefore cannot be as bad as you say when i see that she appears in berlin we will then rediscuss the matter but desnoyers was not there to confirm his mother's artless opinions just as soon as he had found a room in a hotel near the river he had hastened to the big hostelry now converted into a hospital the guard told him that he could not speak to the director until the afternoon in order to curb his impatience he walked through the street leading to the basilica 
passed all the booths and shops with pictures and pious souvenirs which had converted the place into a big bazaar here and in the gardens adjoining the church he saw wounded convalescents with uniforms stained with traces of the combat their cloaks were greatly soiled in spite of repeated brushings the mud the blood and the rain had left indelible spots and made them as stiff as cardboard some of the wounded had cut their sleeves in order to avoid the cruel friction on their shattered arms others still showed on their trousers the rents made by the devastating shells they were fighters of all ranks and of many races infantry cavalry artillerymen soldiers from the metropolis and from the colonies french farmers and african sharpshooters red heads faces of mohammedan olive and the black countenances of the Senegalese with eyes of fire and thick bluish blubber lips some showing the good nature and sedentary obesity of the middle-class man suddenly converted into a warrior others sinewy alert with the aggressive profile of men born to fight and experienced in foreign fields the city formerly visited by the hopeful catholic sick was now invaded by a crowd no less dolorous but clad in carnival colors all in spite of their physical distress had a certain air of good cheer and satisfaction they had seen death very near slipping out from his bony claws into a new joy and zest in life with their cloaks adorned with medals their theatrical moorish garments their kepis and their african headdresses this heroic band presented nevertheless a lamentable aspect very few still preserved the noble vertical carriage the pride of the superior human being they were walking along bent almost double limping dragging themselves forward by the help of a staff or friendly arm others had to let themselves be pushed along stretched out on the handcarts which had so often conducted the devout sick from the station to the grotto of the virgin some were feeling their way along blindly leaning on a child or nurse the first encounters in belgium and in the east a mere half-dozen battles had been enough to produce these physical wrecks still showing a manly nobility in spite of the most horrible outrages these organisms struggling so tenaciously to regain their hold on life bringing their reviving energies out into the sunlight represented but the most minute part of the number mowed down by the scythe of death back of them were thousands and thousands of comrades groaning on hospital beds from which they would probably never rise thousands and thousands were hidden forever in the bosom of the earth moistened by their death agony fatal land which upon receiving a hail of projectiles brought forth a harvest of bristling crosses war now showed itself to desnoyers with all its cruel hideousness he had been accustomed to speak of it heretofore as those in robust health speak of death knowing that it exists and is horrible but seeing it afar off so far off that it arouses no real emotion the explosion of the shells were accompanying their destructive brutality with a ferocious mockery grotesquely disfiguring the human body he saw wounded objects just beginning to recover their vital force who were but rough skeletons of men frightful caricatures human rags saved from the tomb by the audacities of science trunks with heads which were dragged along on wheeled platforms fragments of skulls whose brains were throbbing under an artificial cap beings without arms and without legs resting in the bottom of little wagons like bits of plaster models or scraps from the dissecting room faces without noses 
that looked like skulls with great black nasal openings and these half men were talking smoking laughing satisfied to see the sky to feel the caress of the sun to have come back to life dominated by that sovereign desire to live which trustingly forgets present misery in the confident hope of something better end of section thirty nine chapter four continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain so strongly was julio impressed that for a little while he forgot the purpose which had brought him thither if those who provoke war from diplomatic chambers or from the tables of the military staff could but see it not in the field of battle fired with the enthusiasm which prejudices judgments but in cold blood as it is seen in the hospitals and cemeteries in the wrecks left in its trail to julio's imagination this terrestrial globe appeared like an enormous ship sailing through infinity its crews poor humanity had spent century after century in exterminating each other on the deck they did not even know what existed under their feet in the hold of the vessel to occupy the same portion of the surface in the sunlight seemed to be the ruling desire of each group men considered superior human beings were pushing these masses to extermination in order to scale the last bridge and hold the helm controlling the course of the boat and all those who felt the overmastering ambition for absolute command knew the same thing nothing not one of them could say with certainty what lay beyond the visible horizon nor whither the ship was drifting the sullen hostility of mystery surrounded them all their life was precarious necessitating incessant care in order to maintain it yet in spite of that the crew for ages and ages had never known an instant of agreement of teamwork of clear reason periodically half of them would clash with the other half they killed each other that they might enslave the vanquished on the rolling deck floating over the abyss they fought that they might cast their victims from the vessel filling its wake with cadavers and from the demented throng there were still springing up gloomy sophistries to prove that a state of war was the perfect state that it ought to go on forever that it was a bad dream on the part of the crew to wish to regard each other as brothers with a common destiny enveloped in the same unsteady environment of mystery ah human misery julio was drawn out of these pessimistic reflections by the childish glee which many of the convalescents were evincing some were mussulmans sharpshooters from algeria and morocco in Lourdes, as they might be anywhere they were interested only in the gifts which the people were showering upon them with patriotic affection they all surveyed with indifference the basilica inhabited by the white lady their only preoccupation being to beg for cigars and sweets finding themselves regaled by the dominant race they became greatly puffed up daring everything like mischievous children what pleased them most was the fact that the ladies would take them by the hand blessed war that permitted them to approach and touch these white women perfumed and smiling as they appeared in their dreams of the paradise of the blessed lady lady they would sigh looking at them with dark sparkling eyes and not content with the hand their dark paws would venture the length of the entire arm while the ladies laughed at this tremulous adoration others would go through the crowds offering their right hand to all the women we touch hands and then they would go away satisfied after receiving the hand-clasp 
desnoyers wandered a long time around the basilica where in the shadow of the trees were long rows of wheeled chairs occupied by the wounded officers and soldiers rested many hours in the blue shade watching their comrades who were able to use their legs the sacred grotto was resplendent with the lights from hundreds of candles devout crowds were kneeling in the open air fixing their eyes in supplication on the sacred stones whilst their thoughts were flying far away to the fields of battle making their petitions with that confidence in divinity which accompanies every distress among the kneeling mass were many soldiers with bandaged heads kepis in hand and tearful eyes up and down the double staircase of the basilica were flitting women clad in white with spotless headdresses that fluttered in such a way that they appeared like flying doves these were the nurses and sisters of charity guiding the steps of the injured desnoyers thought he recognized marguerite in every one of them but the prompt disillusion following each of these discoveries soon made him doubtful about the outcome of his journey she was not in lourdes either he would never find her in that france so immeasurably expanded by the war that it had converted every town into a hospital his afternoon explorations were no more successful the employees listened to his interrogations with a distraught air he could come back again just now they were taken up with the announcement that another hospital train was on the way the great battle was still going on near paris they had to improvise lodgings for the new consignment of mutilated humanity in order to pass away the time until his return desnoyers went back to the garden near the grotto he was planning to return to pau that night there was evidently nothing more to do at lourdes in what direction should he now continue his search suddenly he felt a thrill down his back the same indefinable sensation which used to warn him of her presence when they were meeting in the gardens of paris marguerite was going to present herself unexpectedly as in the old days without his knowing from exactly what spot as though she came out of the earth or descended from the clouds after a second's thought he smiled bitterly mere tricks of his desire illusions upon turning his head he recognized the falsity of his hope nobody was following his footsteps he was the only being going down the centre of the avenue near him in the diaphanous white of a guardian angel was a nurse poor blind man desnoyers was passing on when a quick movement on the part of the white-clad woman an evident desire to escape notice to hide her face by looking at the plants attracted his attention he was slow in recognizing her two little ringlets escaping from the band of her cap made him guess the hidden head of hair the feet shod in white were the signs which enabled him to reconstruct the person somewhat disfigured by the severe uniform her face was pale and sad there wasn't a trace left in it of the old vanities that used to give it its childish doll-like beauty in the depths of those great dark circled eyes life seemed to be reflected in new forms marguerite they stared at one another for a long while as though hypnotized with surprise she looked alarmed when desnoyers advanced a step toward her no no her eyes her hands her entire body seemed to protest to repel his approach to hold him motionless fear that he might come near her made her go toward him she said a few words to the soldier who remained on the bench receiving across the bandage on his face a ray of sunlight which he did not appear to feel then she rose going to meet julio and continued forward indicating by a gesture that they must find some place further on where the wounded man could not hear them she led the way to a side path from which she could see the blind man confided to her care they stood motionless face to face desnoyers wished to say many things many but he hesitated not knowing how to frame his complaints his pleadings his endearments far above all these thoughts towered one fatal dominant and wrathful 
who is that man the spiteful accent the harsh voice with which he said these words surprised him as though they came from someone else's mouth the nurse looked at him with her great limpid eyes eyes that seemed forever freed from contractions of surprise or fear her response slipped from her with equal directness it is laurier it is my husband laurier julio looked doubtfully and for a long time at the soldier before he could be convinced that blind officer motionless on the bench that figure of heroic grief was laurier at first glance he appeared prematurely old with roughened and bronzed skin so furrowed with lines that they converged like rays around all the openings of his face his hair was beginning to whiten on the temples and in the beard which covered his cheeks he had lived twenty years in that one month at the same time he appeared younger with a youthfulness that was radiating an inward vigor with the strength of a soul which has suffered the most violent emotions and firm and serene in the satisfaction of duty fulfilled can no longer know fear as desnoyers contemplated him he felt both admiration and jealousy he was ashamed to admit the aversion inspired by the wounded man so sorely wounded that he was unable to see what was going on around him his hatred was a form of cowardice terrifying in its persistence how pensive were marguerite's eyes if she took them off her patient for a few seconds she had never looked at him in that way he knew all the amorous gradations of her glance but her fixed gaze on this injured man was something entirely different something that he had never seen before he spoke with the fury of a lover who discovers an infidelity and for this you have run away without warning without a word you have abandoned me in order to go in search of him tell me why did you come why did you come i came because it was my duty then she spoke like a mother who takes advantage of a parenthesis of surprise in an irascible child's temper in order to counsel self-control and explained how it had all happened she had received the news of laurier's wounding just as she and her mother were preparing to leave paris she had not hesitated an instant her duty was to hasten to the aid of this man she had been doing a great deal of thinking in the last few weeks the war had made her ponder much on the values in life her eyes had been getting glimpses of new horizons our destiny is not mere pleasure and selfish satisfaction we ought to take part in pain and sacrifice she had wanted to work for her country to share the general stress to serve as other women did and since she was disposed to devote herself to strangers was it not natural that she should prefer to help this man whom she had so greatly wronged there still lived in her memory the moment in which she had seen him approach the station completely alone among so many who had the consolation of loving arms when departing in search of death her pity had become still more acute on hearing of his misfortune a shell had exploded near him killing all those around him of his many wounds the only serious one was that on his face he had completely lost the sight of one eye and the doctors were keeping the other bound up hoping to save it but she was very doubtful about it she was almost sure that laurier would be blind marguerite's voice trembled when saying this as if she were going to cry although her eyes were tearless they did not now feel the irresistible necessity for tears weeping had become something superfluous like many other luxuries of peaceful days her eyes had seen so much in so few days how you love him exclaimed julio fearing that they might be overheard and in order to keep him at a distance she had been speaking as though to a friend but her lover's sadness broke down her reserve no i love you i shall always love you the simplicity with which she said this and her sudden tenderness of tone revived desnoyers hopes and the other one he asked anxiously upon receiving a reply it seemed to him as though something had just passed across the sun veiling its light temporarily it was as though a cloud had drifted over the land and over his thoughts enveloping them 
in an unbearable chill i love him too end of section forty forty one part two chapter four continued of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain she said it with a look that seemed to implore pardon with the sad sincerity of one who has given up lying and weeps in foreseeing the injury that the truth must inflict he felt his hard wrath suddenly dwindling like a crumbling mountain ah oh, marguerite his voice was tremulous and despairing could it be possible that everything between these two was going to end thus simply were her former vows mere lies they had been attracted to each other by an irresistible affinity in order to be together for ever to be one and now suddenly hardened by indifference were they to drift apart like two unfriendly bodies what did this absurdity about loving him at the same time that she loved her former husband mean anyway marguerite hung her head murmuring desperately you are a man i am a woman you would never understand me no matter what i may say men are not able to comprehend certain of our mysteries a woman would be better able to appreciate the complexity desnoyers felt that he must know his fate in all its cruelty she might speak without fear he felt strong enough to bear the blow what had laurier said when he found that he was being so tenderly cared for by marguerite he does not know who i am he believes me to be a war nurse like the rest who pities him seeing him alone and blind with no relatives to write to him or visit him at certain times i have almost suspected that he guesses the truth my voice the touch of my hands made him shiver at first as though with an unpleasant sensation i have told him that i am a belgian lady who has lost her loved ones and is alone in the world he has told me his life's story very sketchily as if he desired to forget a hated past never one disagreeable word about his former wife there are nights when i think he knows me that he takes advantage of his blindness in order to prolong his feigned ignorance and that distresses me i long for him to recover his sight for the doctors to save that doubtful eye and yet at the same time i feel afraid what will he say when he recognizes me but no it is better that he should see no matter what may result you cannot understand my anxiety you cannot know what i am suffering she was silent for an instant trying to regain her self-control again tortured with the agony of her soul oh the war she resumed what changes in our life two months ago my present situation would have appeared impossible unimaginable i caring for my husband fearing that he would discover my identity and leave me yet at the same time wishing that he would recognize me and pardon me it is only one week that i have been with him i disguise my voice when i can and avoid words that may reveal the truth but this cannot keep up much longer it is only in novels that such painful situations turn out happily doubt suddenly overwhelmed her i believe she continued that he has recognized me from the first he is silent and feigns ignorance because he despises me because he can never bring himself to pardon me i have been so bad i have wronged him so she was recalling the long and reflective silences of the wounded man after she had dropped some imprudent words after two days of submission to her care he had been somewhat rebellious avoiding going out with her for a walk because of his blind helplessness and comprehending the uselessness of his resistance he had finally yielded in passive silence let him think what he will concluded marguerite courageously let him despise me i am here where i ought to be i need his forgiveness but if he does not pardon me i shall stay with him just the same there are moments when i wish that he may never recover his sight so that he may always need me so that i may pass my life at his side sacrificing everything for him and i said desnoyers marguerite looked at him with clouded eyes as though she were just awakening it was true and the other one 
kindled by the proposed sacrifice which was to be her expiation she had forgotten the man before her you she said after a long pause you must leave me life is not what we have thought it had it not been for the war we might perhaps have realized our dream but now listen carefully and try to understand for the remainder of my life i shall carry the heaviest burden and yet at the same time it will be sweet since the more it weighs me down the greater will my atonement be never will i leave this man whom i have so grievously wronged now that he is more alone in the world and will need protection like a child why do you come to share my fate how could it be possible for you to live with a nurse constantly at the side of a blind and worthy man whom we would constantly offend with our passion no it is better for us to part go your way alone and untrammelled leave me you will meet other women who will make you more happy than i yours is the temperament that finds new pleasures at every step she stood firmly to her decision her voice was calm but back of it trembled the emotion of a last farewell to a joy which was going from her forever the man would be loved by others and she was giving him up but the noble sadness of the sacrifice restored her courage only by this renunciation could she expiate her sins julio dropped his eyes vanquished and perplexed the picture of the future outlined by marguerite terrified him to live with her as a nurse taking advantage of her patient's blindness would be to offer him fresh insult every day ah no that would be villainy indeed he was now ashamed to recall the malignity with which a little while before he had regarded this innocent unfortunate he realized that he was powerless to contend with him weak and helpless as he was sitting there on the garden bench he was stronger and more deserving of respect than julio desnoyers with all his youth and elegance the victim had amounted to something in his life he had done what julio had not dared to do this sudden conviction of his inferiority made him cry out like an abandoned child what will become of me marguerite too contemplating the love which was going from her forever her vanquished hopes the future illumined by the satisfaction of duty fulfilled but monotonous and painful cried out and i what will become of me as though he had suddenly found a solution which was reviving his courage desnoyers said listen marguerite i can read your soul you love this man and you do well he is superior to me and women are always attracted by superiority i am a coward yes do not protest i am a coward with all my youth with all my strength why should you not have been impressed by the conduct of this man but i will atone for past wrongs this country is yours marguerite i will fight for it do not say no and moved by his hasty heroism he outlined the plan more definitely he was going to be a soldier soon she would hear him well spoken of his idea was either to be stretched on the battlefield in his first encounter or to astonish the world by his bravery in this way the impossible situation would settle itself either the oblivion of death or glory no no interrupted marguerite in an anguished tone you know one is enough how horrible you too wounded mutilated forever perhaps dead no you must live i want you to live even though you might belong to another let me know that you exist let me see you sometimes even though you may have forgotten me even though you may pass me with indifference as if you did not know me in this outburst her deep love for him rang true her heroic and inflexible love which would accept all penalties for herself if only the beloved one might continue to live but then in order that julio might not feel any false hopes she added live you must not die that would be for me another torment but live without me no matter how much we may talk about it my destiny beside the other one is marked out forever oh how you love him how you have deceived me in a last desperate attempt at explanation she again repeated what she had said at the beginning of their interview she loved julio and she loved her husband they were different kinds of love she could not say which was the stronger but misfortune was forcing her to choose between the two and she was accepting the most difficult the one demanding 
the greatest sacrifices you are a man and you will never be able to understand me a woman would comprehend me it seemed to julio as he looked around him as though the afternoon were undergoing some celestial phenomenon the garden was still illuminated by the sun but the green of the trees the yellow of the ground the blue of the sky all appeared to him as dark and shadowy as though a rain of ashes were falling then all is over between us his pleading trembling voice charged with tears made her turn her head to hide her emotion then in the painful silence the two despairs formed one and the same question as if interrogating the shades of the future what will become of me murmured the man and like an echo her lips repeated what will become of me all had been said hopeless words came between the two like an obstacle momentarily increasing in size impelling them in opposite directions why prolong the painful interview marguerite showed the ready and energetic decision of a woman who wishes to bring a scene to a close good-bye her face had assumed a yellowish cast her pupils had become dull and clouded like the glass of a lantern when the light dies out good-bye she must go to her patient she went away without looking at him and desnoyers instinctively went in the opposite direction as he became more self-controlled and turned to look at her again he saw her moving on and giving her arm to the blind man without once turning her head he now felt convinced that he should never see her again and became oppressed by an almost suffocating agony and could two beings who had formerly considered the universe concentrated in their persons thus easily be separated for ever his desperation at finding himself alone made him accuse himself of stupidity now his thoughts came tumbling over each other in a tumultuous throng and each one of them seemed to him sufficient to have convinced marguerite he certainly had not known how to express himself he would have to talk with her again and he decided to remain in lourdes he passed a night of torture in the hotel listening to the ripple of the river among its stones insomnia had him in its fierce jaws gnawing at him with interminable agony he turned on the light several times but was not able to read his eyes looked with stupid fixity at the patterns of the wallpaper and the pious pictures around the room which had evidently served as the lodging-place of some rich traveller he remained motionless and as abstracted as an oriental who thinks himself into an absolute lack of thought one idea only was dancing in the vacuum in his skull i shall never see her again can such a thing be possible he drowsed for a few seconds only to be awakened with the sensation that some horrible explosion was sending him through the air and so with sweats of anguish he wakefully passed the hours until in the gloom of his room the dawn showed a milky rectangle of light and began to be reflected on the window curtains the velvet-like caress of day finally closed his eyes upon awakening he found that the morning was well advanced and he hurried to the garden of the grotto oh the hours of tremulous and unavailing waiting believing that he recognized marguerite in every white-clad lady that came along guiding a wounded patient by afternoon after a lunch whose dishes filed past him untouched he returned to the garden in search of her beholding her in the distance with the blind man leaning on her arm a feeling of faintness came over him she looked to him taller thinner her face sharper with two dark hollows in her cheeks and her eyes bright with fever the lids drawn with weariness he suspected that she too had passed an anguished night of tenacious self-centred thought of grievous stupefaction like his own in the room of her hotel suddenly he felt all the weight of insomnia and listlessness all the depressing emotion of the cruel sensations experienced in the last few hours oh how miserable they both were she was walking warily looking from one side to the other as though foreseeing danger upon discovering him she clung to her charge casting upon her former lover a look of entreaty of desperation imploring pity ay that look he felt ashamed of himself his personality appeared to be unrolling itself before him 
and he surveyed himself with the eyes of a judge what was this seduced and useless man called julio desnoyers doing there tormenting with his presence a poor woman trying to turn her from her righteous repentance insisting on his selfish and petty desires when all humanity was thinking of other things his cowardice angered him like a thief taking advantage of the sleep of his victim he was stalking around this brave and true man who could not see him who could not defend himself in order to rob him of the only affection that he had in the world which had so miraculously returned to him very well gentleman desnoyers oh what a scoundrel he was such subconscious insults made him draw himself erect in haughty cruel and inexorable defiance against that other i who so richly deserved the judge's scorn he turned his head away he could not meet marguerite's piteous eyes he feared their mute reproach neither did he dare to look at the blind man in his shabby and heroic uniform with his countenance aged by duty and glory he feared him like remorse so the vanquished lover turned his back on the two and went away with a firm step good-bye love good-bye happiness he marched quickly and bravely on a miracle had just taken place within him he had found the right road at last to paris a new impetus was going to fill the vacuum of his objectless existence end of section forty one part two chapter five of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by vicente blasco ibanez translated by charlotte brewster jordan this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the invasion don marcelo was fleeing to take refuge in his castle when he met the mayor of villeblanche the noise of the firing had made him hurry to the barricade when he learned of the apparition of the group of stragglers he threw up his hands in despair they were crazy their resistance was going to be fatal for the village and he ran on to beg them to cease for some time nothing happened to disturb the morning calm desnoyers had climbed to the top of his towers and was surveying the country with his field glasses he couldn't make out the highway through the nearest group of trees but he suspected that underneath their branches great activity was going on masses of men on guard troops preparing for the attack the unexpected defence of the fugitives had upset the advance of the invasion desnoyers thought despairingly of that handful of mad fellows and their stubborn chief what was their fate going to be focusing his glasses on the village he saw the red spots of kepis waving like poppies over the green of the meadows they were the retreating men now convinced of the uselessness of their resistance perhaps they had found a ford or forgotten boat by which they might cross the marne and so were continuing their retreat toward the river at any minute now the germans were going to enter villeblanche half an hour of profound silence passed by the village lay silhouetted against a background of hills a mass of roofs beneath the church tower finished with its cross and iron weathercock everything seemed as tranquil as in the best days of peace suddenly he noticed that the grove was vomiting forth something noisy and penetrating a bubble of vapor accompanied by a deafening report something was hurtling through the air with a strident curve then a roof in the village opened like a crater vomiting forth flying wood fragments of plaster and broken furniture all the interior of the house seemed to be escaping in a stream of smoke dirt and splinters the invaders were bombarding villeblanche before attempting attack as though fearing to encounter persistent resistance in its streets more projectiles fell some passed over the houses exploding between the hamlet and the castle the towers of the desnoyers property were beginning to attract the aim of the artillerymen the owner was therefore about to abandon his dangerous observatory when he saw something white like a tablecloth or sheet floating from the church tower his neighbors had hoisted this signal of peace 
in order to avoid bombardment a few more missiles fell and then there was silence when don marcelo reached his park he found the warden burying at the foot of a tree the sporting rifles still remaining in his castle then he went toward the great iron gates the enemies were going to come and he had to receive them while uneasily awaiting their arrival his compunctions again tormented him what was he doing there why had he remained but his obstinate temperament immediately put aside the promptings of fear he was there because he had to guard his own besides it was too late now to think about such things suddenly the morning stillness was broken by a sound like the deafening tearing of strong cloth shots master said the warden firing it must be in the square a few minutes after they saw running toward them a woman from the village an old soul dried up and darkened by age who was panting from her great exertion and looking wildly around her she was fleeing blindly trying to escape from danger and shut out horrible visions desnoyers and the keeper's family listened to her explanations interrupted with hiccups of terror the germans were in villeblanche they had entered first in an automobile driven at full speed from one end of the village to the other its mitrailleuse was firing at random against closed houses and open doors knocking down all the people in sight the old woman flung up her arms with a gesture of terror dead many dead wounded blood then other iron-plated vehicles had stopped in the square and behind them cavalrymen battalions of infantry many battalions coming from everywhere the helmeted men seemed furious they accused the villagers of having fired at them in the square they had struck the mayor and villagers who had come forward to meet them the priest bending over some of the dying had also been trodden under foot all prisoners the germans were talking of shooting them the old dame's words were cut short by the rumble of approaching automobiles open the gates commanded the owner to the warden the massive iron grill work swung open and was never again closed all property rights were at an end an enormous automobile covered with dust and filled with men stopped at the entrance behind them sounded the horns of other vehicles that were putting on the brakes desnoyers saw soldiers leaping out all wearing the greenish-gray uniform with a sheath of the same tone covering the pointed cask the one who marched at their head put his revolver to the millionaire's forehead where are the sharpshooters he asked he was pale with the pallor of wrath vengeance and fear his face was trembling under the influence of his triple emotion don marcelo explained slowly contemplating at a short distance from his eyes the black circle of the threatening tube he had not seen any sharpshooters the only inhabitants of the castle were the warden with his family and himself the owner of the castle the officer surveyed the edifice and then examined desnoyers with evident astonishment as though he thought his appearance too unpretentious for a proprietor he had taken him for a simple employee and his respect for social rank made him lower his revolver he did not however alter his haughty attitude he pressed don marcelo into the service as a guide making him search ahead of him while forty soldiers grouped themselves at his back they advanced in two files to the shelter of the trees which bordered the central avenue with their guns ready to shoot and looking uneasily at the castle windows as though expecting to receive from them hidden shots desnoyers marched tranquilly through the centre and the official who had been imitating the precautions of his men finally joined him when he was crossing the drawbridge the armed men scattered through the rooms in search of the enemy they ran their bayonets through beds and divans some with automatic destructiveness slit the draperies and the rich bed coverings the owner protested what was the sense in such useless destruction he was suffering unbearable torture at seeing the enormous boots spotting the rugs with mud on hearing the clash of guns and knapsacks against the most fragile choices pieces of furniture poor historic mansion the officer looked amazed 
that he should protest for such trifling cause but he gave orders in german and his men ceased their rude explorations then in justification of this extraordinary respect he added in french i believe that you are going to have the honor of entertaining here the general of our division the certainty that the castle did not hold any hidden enemies made him more amiable he nevertheless persisted in his wrath against the sharpshooters a group of the villagers had opened fire upon the uhlans when they were entering unsuspiciously after the retreat of the french desnoyers felt it necessary to protest they were neither inhabitants nor sharpshooters they were french soldiers he took good care to be silent about their presence at the barricade but he insisted that he had distinguished their uniforms from a tower of the castle the official made a threatening face you too you who appear a reasonable man can repeat such yarns as these and in order to close the conversation he said arrogantly they were wearing uniforms then if you persist in saying so but they were sharpshooters just the same the french government has distributed arms and uniforms among the farmers that they may assassinate us belgium did the same thing but we know their tricks and we know how to punish them too the village was going to be burned it was necessary to avenge the four germans dead lying on the outskirts of villeblanche near the barricade the mayor the priest the principal inhabitants would all be shot by the time they reached the top floor desnoyers could see floating above the boughs of his park dark clouds whose outlines were reddened by the sun the top of the bell tower was the only thing that he could distinguish at that distance around the iron weathercock were flying long thin fringes like black cobwebs lifted by the breeze an odor of burning wood came toward the castle the german greeted this spectacle with a cruel smile then on descending to the park he ordered desnoyers to follow him his liberty and his dignity had come to an end henceforth he was going to be an underling at the beck and call of these men who would dispose of him as their whims directed ay why had he remained he obeyed climbing into an automobile beside the officer who was still carrying his revolver in his right hand his men distributed themselves through the castle and outbuildings in order to prevent the flight of an imaginary enemy the warden and his family seemed to be saying good-bye to him with their eyes perhaps they were taking him to his death beyond the castle woods a new world was coming into existence the short cut to villeblanche seemed to desnoyers a leap of millions of leagues a fall into a red planet where men and things were covered with the film of smoke and the glare of fire he saw the village under a dark canopy spotted with sparks and glowing embers the bell tower was burning like an enormous torch the roof of the church was breaking into flames with a crashing fury the glare of the holocaust seemed to shrivel and grow pale in the impassive light of the sun running across the fields with the haste of desperation were shrieking women and children the animals had escaped from the stables and driven forth by the flames were racing wildly across the country the cow and the workhorse were dragging their halters broken by their flight their flanks were smoking and smelt of burnt hair the pigs the sheep and the chickens were all tearing along mingled with the cats and the dogs all the domestic animals were returning to a brute existence fleeing from civilized man shots were heard and hellish ha-has the soldiers outside of the village were making themselves merry in this hunt for fugitives their guns were aimed at beasts and were hitting people. End of section forty two.